Um, well, maybe maybe I can start with um, with uh, Nana's presentation, the last, and then I will come back to the first uh, by Hikaru. Um, but uh, as a matter of fact, it's it's quite special that uh, when uh, when the brief is to talk about uh, scarcity, the response is uh, generosity. So I like that because the scarcity is, uh, of course, uh, uniquely on the side of the means, but not on the side of the outcome of what should be produced. So if we with uh, scarce means could produce a generous environment, then that, that is exactly what, what, what this day was about, I think, and what we, what we should, um, should talk about. And well, what, what Nana's talk definitely made sure was that, uh, that, we, that it can sometimes be in uh, very small things which make, uh, which make the success of a place. Maybe that's uh, that to start with. So if I then would relate to uh, uh, to Hicks' uh, uh, first first contribution, which was I think the most uh, encompassing one that we had the, these days, with setting very high standards uh, for us all as uh, designers, I was um, I was wondering what we are about to do if, if we cannot meet those standards. Of course, we, we strive for those standards. Uh, we definitely do. And some of us are entirely up to us. Uh, some of the things that, that he mentioned are entirely up to our own business, but not all of it. Some of it is uh, maybe unable. Uh, we, we, can, we can be unable to achieve it every now and then. And I thought that in the afternoon, um, possible answers to that uh, difficulty were presented by both Alison and uh, Hans, who brought in the discussion of negotiation, or you could also say um, of uh, strategic thinking, of uh, asking yourself if I have to act in this particular uh, circumstances, what then should I focus on? If I realize that sometimes I have to uh, bluntly accept, what then is for me the most important thing to make a difference? So I think that was uh, in uh, in both these uh, these uh, these afternoon uh, talks uh, the issue. And then I was I was pleased that that Hans could could. Uh, could show us that uh, even the designer could uh, take the lead in uh, negotiating while uh, overseeing uh, all or most of the of the issues at stake. That he could really organize a conversation on what everybody would agree upon is the most important thing to do. Maybe I would also like to. Um, to reflect on um, on the presentations of uh, uh, both Lucy and you, well, who seem very diverse, but they brought they brought um, they brought mainly two two ideas uh, to me. The first one was that uh, even even if their cases were really far apart which then again inspires me of the idea that all architecture is local, even if there are strong, strong uh, attempts to standardize and to generalize, uh, it always comes up to a local answer to something that is particular and specific at a particular place. And that's also why, why uh, tying the, the threads together to, to see the larger picture is uh, not an easy task to, to fulfill, but well, what were the two the two um, the two thoughts that came to my mind when uh, when comparing uh, both of their cases uh, was that they, they had in, in in common that they uh, connected 
an architectural brief or a design brief with a community. In Lucy's case, it was a community of settlers, colonists, in well, many, many centuries ago, who had to, to make a living in, in a place that was derelict before they came. Um, a very different community in a Hughes case, uh, uh, case study. Uh, and then I refer to the housing associations that uh, Siegel worked with, where a small community of people sharing, sharing a plot uh, would, uh, well, would learn to know each other by building, by living then there together. So there, uh, there are communities in, uh, engaged there, but of course the buildings outlive the communities and that was particularly clear in what uh, Lucy was presenting that after a while when history goes on these communities are not longer there which then gives me the idea that uh, the value that uh, um, that has to be uh, focused on in the design is maybe uh, put on the agenda by a particular group of people. So you meet individual and particular needs in a particular time of uh, time and a particular space, but there will have to be something more general about it, something more enviable for all of us, not only for the people involved in, in, in forming the brief, that makes it uh, value last. And then maybe there's there's a there's a sad a side reflection to that in in in, in the case of these uh, of Montpazier, where where we then can see that uh, the original community after a few centuries has made way to well to maybe tourists only, which is then maybe bringing to the fore how if maybe not in the end uh, the the value of money and uh, the ability to purchase the values that everybody can see is, uh, is taking over. So that would be a more, a more uh, worthy reflection then. But the, the, second, the second thought I had there was, um, was on scale. What would be the, the proper scale to to, to work on, to design on. And I was, uh, I am sometimes wondering if, uh, if not uh, planning is, is, is in issues like this, if not planning is the more uh, valuable uh, profession, the more uh, valuable task to do. Here we only saw very small, very small uh, contributions, even the larger ones. There, was, there were, of course, large, uh, large differences in scale, but even the, even the larger ones have only a limited value. Wouldn't it be better to go for larger planning commissions where you could, uh, could do good for a larger number of people? And then so is architecture not only just about small money so I think that that particularly the, the case that, that uh, Hugh was presenting on, on Walter Siegel offers arguments to, to, go, uh, to go against such an idea. And that was because, he, um, because what he was dealing with in the housing association uh, cases, he was dealing with, uh, uh, well, derelict plots residual plots, plots that otherwise would never be used and that uh, anyhow can made to good use by the finer tools, not the tools of planning, but the finer tools of, of architecture and design while really having a detailed and careful look to what these uh, difficult places, or these leftover places could offer. Um, well, to, to bring them to good use. So that may be small money, but a lot of small money is also a lot of uh, value then, I would say. 
and maybe this is also the 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 place to connect again to to um, to what uh, uh, Pablo was 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 telling and Nana as well, because both talked about the residual spaces. In Nana's case, I think of the the footbridge, the pedestrian bridge, and the, the room under it. Uh, residual places that maybe were not uh, not really the focus of uh, of uh, of uh, conscious design, but residual spaces that have been turned into public use uh, and thereby producing uh, generosity. Okay, I think I I believe the the word now to. Bo or Philip or whoever feels to to take over. Go ahead, Bo. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the speakers and, and to Richard for organising. Um, I mean, it's interesting because there can't quite hear you. Oh, really? Um, can you hear me now? Better. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try and speak up a bit. Um, it was interesting how all of the the eight. Uh, talks today were quite different and on very different um, sort of subjects. However, there are a number of um, common themes, it seems to me, that emerged as, as the day progressed, um, starting with Hikari's um, talk at the beginning, which um, began with the idea of dimension. Um, and this is something which is of um, great interest to me, um, you know, starting with the idea of um, embodied dimensions um, which you talked about and the idea of using the body as a measuring device um, and how these you know initial kind of transferable length dimensions both in, in Europe and Western Asia um, are based on those which were you know reference parts or, or um, motions of the, the human body and, and whilst these dimensions were not um, in initially precisely standardized, the order of magnitude um, with respect to one, each, one, each, um, one another was evident to those who used them. So that's, you know, the farmer or the craftsman or the architect. So, um, but that, you know, the, the idea of dimension has, you know, its attitude towards dimension has changed over time. And we've sort of come to this point of, um, you know, trying to standardize them and, you know, this idea of standardization, which then again is another theme, which I thought was common to a number of the talks today. Um, and I, I, I guess I have a kind of problem with um, standardization because it, it sort of has come at the detriment of um, craft and the craftsmen with the, you know, um, with industrial revolution and mass production sort of pushing it. Um, so, so that was just something that I was pondering um, on one level. Another theme that I thought could address some of the issues raised today was that of time, um, and, and and particularly in this in in relation to kind of city making and and how cities um, are made and remade by people, you know, through architecture. Um, it's a you know time as the fourth dimension in architecture. Um, well, it's often overlooked in architecture. We're sort of slightly obsessed with the three dimensions, um, but how architecture endures and how cities are made, how it, they're adapted and changed, um, like I said, by people at different times over the years um, and, and at different scales. Um, it's about an architecture that embodies, you know, a process that involves, you know, I, in my opinion, loosely fitting things together. I mean, I just want to shift slightly and, and just um, sort of talk about um, Walter Siegel um, in Hughes' um, talk today. Um, someone, you know, I've, I've been a, a sort of strong believer in, in Siegel's, Siegel and his methods for, for a number of years. And, you know, I always wonder why we, we haven't seen more of of this happening, you know, in the decades that have passed since. Um, I mean, one side question I had would be, um, Hugh, 
what is the type working title of your PhD, you know, just out of curiosity. Um, but what I feel the Siegel offered, um, you know, at least in the case of the house builders um, on Walter's Way and, and the other examples was the freedom for people to build and to use their hands. Um, and if we view this at the, the scale of the city, um, you know, this offers not a fundamental basis for increasing um, the capacity of people, of citizens to engage with and enjoy the benefits of the city. And we see this a lot um, in informal cities, you know, um, in my work, I've, this is something that's emerged quite strongly. I'm, I'm not so familiar with how this concept is, um, it, you know, happens in, in, in the developed world so much, but I think, you know, just hearing Hugh's talk today, just reminded me of that um, idea. So then it comes back to this idea about um, human experience for me. Um, and when we talk about economies of architecture, we talk, and then, you know, one of the other themes that was um, common to all, I'd say, um, today is, is about value and what value really means. You know, what, um, should we be shifting value from an economic value to social and cultural and ethical, you know, um, if we're talking about freedoms and people's capacities, it's about ethics and it's about experience. And for me, um, we need to consider that both as um, individuals and collectively how that works on both those levels um, in order, I suppose, to, to try and seek in the common economy of architecture that um, has appropriate value. Um, I think I'll leave it there for now. So over to you, Phil. Yeah, um, well, that's, that leads right into what I was wanting to say. Um, um, I guess I want, if one could try to generalize about the whole day and one would, I suppose, expect this within an architectural discourse, perhaps, is that, um, you know, we, we um, find ourselves um, responsible um, to, as architects, to be thinking about economy beyond the financial, as um, many people have said in different ways. Um, you know, normally the word economic or to be ec economical, or, or even just the word economy is always about money or cost effectiveness or affordability or um, or being prudent as like Gordon Brown would say, you know, um, and um, when he was chancellor. Um, and however, the, I mean, you know, for example, Nana, this was brilliant because here you were speaking um, glowingly about this um, South Bank Centre uh, that, um, on, on a gray day with, <laughs> with the rain and nobody there and um, black and white pictures, half of them, you know, and, um, and this kind of gray concrete um, um, place that um, of course there's been a lot of debate through the years about whether that's beautiful or not, you know, and, um, and whether that's a gregarious place or not. But how wonderful to hear you um, being so optimistic and, and um, loving about that place um, and, and appreciative of that kind of um, um, spirit that was um, offered to us in the post-war era in UK um, by public um, bodies, like um, by, by the, so it, 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 these are truly public buildings that, um, and uh, in the spirit of um, social welfare. Yeah? And, and so, and you have, um, it's how wonderful that you can, can um, appreciate that and, 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 and speak about it in, in, with such um, optimism. Yeah, uh, that, that was great. Um, and um, so, it, so really um, this kind of uh, shift from thinking about economy as um, being something about cost, I mean, um, Hikaru also um, said it right from the beginning that, you know, cost um, is, um, but how did you put it? Value does not, e values do not equal price. 
Yeah. Um, so the word value came up all the way through the day. And, you know, um, uh, I guess a broader, broader views of what, what value is, social value, cultural value, um, human, humanitarian value. Yeah. Um, and so the, the word generosity somehow um, says, says that right um, from the beginning. Um, I was reminded when, um, and I, so I, you know, while, while people were talking, I looked up on my phone. Um, let me just get it again back. Um, the manifesto that um, Shelley McNamara and, and, um, um, and Yvonne Farrell did um, for the Venice Biennale um, called Free Space. And um, I think that that's what they were trying to um, speak about um, in a very general way. They were, um, it, uh, I think they were thinking about um, this kind of economy, this uh, kind of social e economy that the uh, architect can um, play a big part in. And so free, I think for them was two meanings. One was free as in it doesn't cost anything. And, 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 and the other one is freedom as um, Bo was just saying. So like the, um, um, like freedom to build or freedom to, freedom to, to, to live or free, um, uh, have, have an egalitarian quality. And um, I just wanna read out just a few of these bits of their manifesto because um, um, I think that somehow it relates directly. Um, free space describes a generosity of spirit and a sense of humanity at the core of architecture's agenda, focusing on the quality of space itself. So that's their first statement. And they go on, I'll read out a few of them, but I'm not gonna read out the whole thing. Free space focuses on architecture's ability to provide free and additional spatial gifts to those who use it and on its ability to address the unspoken wishes of strangers. So, um, it's sort of like, I guess they're talking about added value or additional value that we can give as architects that is beyond the brief or beyond the scope of the budget or the, or the expectations of um, the client. Um, uh, I think that's what the, it's a, it's a kind of ability to provide free and additional spatial gifts. Free space celebrates architecture's capacity to find additional and unexpected generosity in each project, even with the most private, defensive, exclusive, or commercially restricted conditions. And then the last one that I'm going to read out, provide, free space provides the opportunity to emphasize nature's free gifts of light, sunlight, and moonlight, air, gravity, materials, natural and man-made resources, and they go on. But so. And I think that's really the, in my mind, that was the um, um, the underlying uh, that uh, debate that we're really having for the whole day in many different kinds of ways. Whether we're, we're, whether Alison's talking about just trying to um, keep the design spirit and uh, quality um, within the cost restraints, or you know, hands. Um, talking about the, um, um, you know, working with, trying to just make a, um, the, the ground floor with a new staircase um, somehow come alive with, um, um, that nobody could imagine that that parking space would be turned into that. And, or Pablo, I mean, that was absolutely spectacular, I thought, that your, your, those schools that you showed and how you, just by turning the, the entrance into the other side towards the favela and using a bit of open space that was um, just left over, um, you know, it's a sense of generosity, but also just a strategic um, um, sleight of hand that is um, by just taking a good look at, you know, the situation um, of that's given 
and the fact that the, the, the children are coming from the favela, not uh, mostly, you know, um, and that it's being, the school had turned its back to it. So, I mean, I, I think that that's, those are all ex extremely um, um, fantastic examples. Um, and then I just say, I mean, um, one more thing. Um, um, I'm reminded, so there's, a, there's a, another point um, other, other than the kind of frugality against generosity question that, you know, um, and this is, um, and nobody, we, we didn't really speak about this very much, um, I don't think anyone, is um, the, I mean, maybe uh, Nana uh, alluded to it, that um, there's a difference between uh, um, an economy in the capitalist world, which is hierarchical, and it really has the rich are at the top and the poor at the bottom, and um, there's a lot of people in between. But there's uh, there's the haves and the haves nots, and um, and that's the, how the economy is is um, structured. And there's the workers and there's the owners, um, and there's another economy which is um, one which is um, uh, public, um, uh, uh, one that's based on public um, good or generosity, and that's what the um, the socialist or the um, or the social welfare um, agendas of the post-war era gave. And the, the South Bank is an, a kind of an example of that, ar architectural example of that, um, where there's a trying to a, an attempt that um, the the, the the wealth of the nation is somehow um, everybody's wealth and um, and should be um, um, not only shared, but um, should be, and that everybody should be able to be educated and be, um, and have, get, have housing and so on. So that, so, um, so those are, those are two different, very different kinds of economic kind of worldviews really. And, um, um, and I, I, uh, and um, so, for example, you know that word economy, which is like um, um, Ashley explained, that was it's a Greek word, household, the ekos, and uh, kind of management, or um, I, I guess I guess that's the best word for 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 um, um, nomos. No, Nemo and but anyway and but this eco oikos is also um, the root of the word ecology and the, that's just like that ecology is like the house and the study of the of the house or the um, so that sort of the, the study of where we live or our our environment and then the economy is the management of our environment. And um, um, you know, so that I'm reminded of um, um, a discussion that I was a part of about a week ago. Um, that I'm very, very fortunate to be uh, in um, with some Australians um, and. There, there was an Aboriginal Australian woman who was um, part of the discussion, who was explaining exactly that idea that um, in those ancient cultures, I mean, the, in Australia, they had, they say that they've been living, um, Aborigines have been living there for 20,000 years um, in a kind of constant way, um, and many, many different cultures across the continent. And she was explaining that they, um, they have a relational economy or, or structure of, of management of the of the country. They, they call it. She calls it the, the country, and and rather than hierarchical. And so that came up also in a number of of um, talks about relationships between things. The 
interrelationships between things as a, as a, um, and, and the management of these interrelationships. Um, and and um, they have a more um, also a cyclical idea of the, of the world rather than a hierarchical one. Okay, I'll just leave it there. Would um, any of the speakers like to respond to any of that? You're all exhausted. No, can I say something? Yeah. Please. Hans, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I, could, I couldn't uh, get my name. I'm, I'm very happy with your last contribution, uh, uh, Phil, especially um, the introduction of the word ecology, which uh, was in, in, in front of my mouth. So I'm happy that you articulated uh, that. But I would like that, uh, to, to uh, connect that to uh, one of Paul's uh, remarks, which I found very, very important really is, um, and that's the issue of the larger scale, because that's where it really happens, um, I think. That's where uh, the cakes are baked, to, to, so to say, uh, and where the important uh, decisions are made. Um, um, so Paul related that to the issue of planning, which of course, in uh, different countries uh, is practically non-existent or, uh, and even in Holland, the, the, the issue of planning uh, has become very, very unpopular the last uh, uh, decade. Um, so I, I, I was wondering who are we addressing then? Uh, who, to, to, to whom is this uh, uh, appeal? Uh, because I think we, as a profession, uh, then have to show what what our assets uh, are. Um, and then I would like to relate back to the two projects that I've uh, shown. Uh, first, a refurbishment project. I'm tempted to say that this was only possible because all the real estate owners in Omort uh, signed a pact together um, to keep the area in the air, to keep investing on management and in, in the hardware of uh, 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 the housing. And that was essential because that provided uh, uh, an element of trust to spend this enormous amount of money in 700 uh, uh, units. Um, and in the case of Klosterburg in The Hague, it's not only the issue that this pact was signed, but also that the uh, city council of The uh, uh, Hague um, was steering all these different uh, uh, sub projects happening in this uh, wider area. Um, and then I think beyond that, there is something else happening because uh, these pacts and these uh, uh, municipal steering uh, policies don't just simply occur. They come from a sort of cultural debate. Um, I won't brag about it, but I have published about the issue of post-war housing in the Netherlands. I've published about Dudok. Uh, working in uh, The Hague, I've tried to uh, uh, articulate what uh, the urban uh, values and the urban opportunities of such areas are. I, I've endlessly argued, uh, okay, this area is close to the inner city of uh, The Hague, it has enormous uh, urban possibilities. And um, I, th I think that that element of, you know, um, ID struggle, um, to avoid the word politics, is, is, is very important for, for the architecture community to uh, engage in, I think. Um, and that's all apart from 
what I'm also arguing for to de develop more bureaucratic uh, skills because I do think that we are convicted to a world of, uh, world of standards and uh, standards in itself are neither good or bad. It's very much on how you wish to apply them. And I think that uh, architecture should uh, really focus on, on, on these uh, topics. I wonder if Hick has anything to say about this. I'm just wondering about, you know, this, um, maybe also Bo, this relationship between standardization and perceived freedoms and the freedoms that exist within rules. I think it's a very, very complicated architectural issue. And I think it's absolutely fundamental to us doing our jobs. Um, I think that the um, the example that of the Walter Siegel um, construction that he came up with uh, through the years is an is brilliant um, response to that, isn't it? That we, he's accepting standardization that's, that's, that's given, that's existing, and he's turning it into freedom. Yeah, to, to, some, sorry, to some extent, Phil, following on from that and relate, it kind of ties back, Richard, to your, um, one of your opening comments about, from OMA about yeah, this idea of mobilizing economic reality you know what Siegel's doing is he's 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 not he's not necessarily promoting standardization. He's accepting it. He's 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 using it and utilizing it and um, uh, seeing. I suppose in um, uh, Paul Vermeulen's words, this idea of kind of um, using that to produce a generous environment. That's kind of scarce means that I uh, um, transforming something that's already existent. Yeah. I couldn't have agreed more with Hans, it's neither good nor bad, so to speak, the tools that we use, it's who, who, who's using them. The, the thing I have a kind of issue with, I guess, in terms of standardization, is that it is a funnel for wealth, essentially. And so if someone is incredibly successful at standardizing something and mass producing it and bringing down the cost, they can be incredibly lucrative, which is not a problem in some senses, but you know, if unchecked, it can be a huge problem, um, particularly when it kind of translates at a global scale and you have these, um, these huge companies that kind of sit above nations almost and transcend them. Um, and that, at the, that sort of scale, I do find a problem because I think that, you know, economies have to relate to the people that somehow live in them and deal with them. <laughs> and yeah, if it loses that human scale, even to the amounts of money that are being spent, um, that can be very tragic. I know that, um, you know, for every, even though someone might be offering a, a great service and a great product and it might be, um, might be really facilitating people's lives in, in a lot of ways, I mean, in the short term, particularly, the long term consequences are slightly less clear as to, you know, uh, uh, the kind of growing gap in inequality and these sorts of things and how you start to bridge that. So I thought both, both kind of counter argument, which of kind of investing in craft, which is, I guess, the kind of traditional counterpoint to standardization is a really interesting one. But then maybe Hughes dem kind of demonstrates how you can kind of do both and there, there is a middle ground um, and we do have to work with standards and standards in relation to rights, obviously I talked about already. Um, one thing I did want to kind of plant into the conversation, I guess, with something that John and I discuss or have been discussing for quite a long time, which is how economies, um, I say a long time, not that long, but how economies are very much geared towards tackling immediate issues as a means of being kind of relevant and urgent. And briefs often, ref this is often reflected in briefs that are geared towards immediate concerns often, and those concerns are prioritized. And I think that we are gonna build more sustainably, whether it's socially or environmentally, we have to think about kind of a more long-term economy. Um, and maybe it is about really, I mean, we were brief about it this year, but I mean, just about repair, like really humble, like things that architects are not interested in. We're interested in refurbishment, but not daily repair and, and siphoning off more money and more budget for just looking after things and tending to the built environment and making sure that it doesn't need that refurbishment in the first place. 
but um, I don't know. Anyway, just some thought. I would totally agree with you on that um, point about repair because repair, as opposed to necessarily refurbishment, much more brings in the individual, you know, and the responsibility and care for what they're repairing, you know, and you know, potentially the ownership of that as well gets transferred and the responsibility gets transferred to the, the user rather than, you know, someone hiring someone else to do that. I mean, well, it suggests that anyway. Um, back to the, the point slightly before um, about the middle ground. Yeah, I mean, my, my question was always, you know, why are we not seeing more of the kind of Walter, Walter Siegel, you know, in, in influencing architecture today? Um, because it is always the kind of middle ground, um, you know, between top-down planning and bottom-up making, which is the interesting... I, you know, I think that um, uh, from what I understand, um, I think Walter Siegel said this himself, that the problem isn't really the um, technology of building that he was, you know, working on. Um, it's the land, the, the cost of land and the, 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 the um, monopolization of land um, is... In this country, anyway, is the problem that that people can't afford um, to build because they can't afford the land, and and the house building um, monopolies have all the land. Mm. Um, and, also yeah. maybe a yeah a tension that exists. Also a tension. Why they haven't, we haven't seen self build or even even cooperative housing and so on um, in this country. I think there's also perhaps a, a tension. That even as architects, we don't fully address maybe between. We, we I think we sometimes group standards or regulations in the same category as um, imposed orthodoxies or monopolies, and that's kind of coming out in this discussion now. Um, there are certain rules, of course, that exist in society that allow us to operate as citizens, and there are certain rules that are used to uh, control us or to make us consume things. And I think there's something, I think it's no, not, my personal view is that it's never as black or white as any of this. I think there's something about, I mean, it really comes back in a way to what um, Paul was saying about every decision being local. I think that there's something incredibly important about um, assessing the context, assessing the situation in which one works to make those judgments. And then of course we get into, again, the kind of uh, economy of energy, because that means as an architect, one has to start sort of, relatively fresh every time you enter a situation, which is then of course a drag on what it means to actually be, uh, to run a business. Um, and I suppose the other thing I just wanted to maybe say briefly was, um, I guess maybe more of a perver perverse thing is this, I think that um, in some ways there's a lot uh, of architecture that exists in simply uh, playing the game and in terms of, adjusting the rules of the game. Some of the greatest examples we can think of, I think, do this. They make minor adjustments to orthodoxies rather than inventing entirely new systems. And I feel like um, in some ways as a profession, it would be good for us to think about that more clearly about getting back into kind of like the fine grain when we're thinking about changing society or contributing to society in a, in a slightly more um, progressive way. It doesn't necessarily need to be replacing one thing with another, but rather could be about infiltrating a subject and extracting something from it. And then, of course, we get into the, the kind of dilemmas that, of course, somebody like Ram Coolhouse is always dragged into, or other architects. Um, are there any more comments or questions from the speakers? Or yeah, I, I, I would like to say one more thing on on what you just said, and, and what has been mentioned before on, uh, on, on, on things like uh, uh, standards and regulations and, and stuff. And, um, and it is as if we are caught in a sort of negative thinking about uh, such uh, things. Um, recently, I have studied uh, the work of uh, Jean-Nicolas uh, Durand, who in many ways is the architectural master of uh, issuing rules and, and regulations and standardizations and stuff. But it's very important to understand where Durand came from. He, he was the architect, uh, or he was an architect training other architects after the French Re Revolution. And architecture changed 
architecture was not there anymore to satisfy uh, the king, so to speak, and to fail, fulfill the dreams of the, the nobility um, at whatever cost uh, 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 it took, it became a public affair. Uh, so Durand, in my opinion, is very much talking about citizenship and therefore also about ecology and money because suddenly architecture didn't spend money of the nobility, who cares? The architects spent money that was ours. And I think uh, comparing where Durand was two centuries ago and comparing where we are now, we really as a profession have to think about uh, what we do with the uh, con uh, conditions we are now operating in. And um, I think that th that won't be happening if we don't start thinking in repeatable models, in, in sharing knowledge, in, in trying to be citizens rather than artists uh, and so forth. I've got a, um, a comment from the audience, which connects to some of the things we've just been said, but also maybe bridges um, what he was talking about and what Ashley was talking about to some degree. Um, Laura Mark, would you like to um, say your question out loud or would you like me to read it? I'd prefer you to say it out loud, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can say it out loud. Uh, so yeah, I was just making a comment about um, Walter Siegel and uh, uh, to my knowledge, there are still quite a lot of people following his building method, but um, I would say it's just not published. Um, you know, the, the kind of method of Walter Siegel isn't necessarily like a glo something glossy that you would see, like, like a photogenic architecture that you would see in a kind of magazine or on a web page or like, you know, um, and I guess that leads itself to not necessarily be kind of seen in the public eye or known about. Um, you know, there there is a group there's kind of community land trusts and there's a group in down in Lewisham actually like carrying out his legacy and building some projects to his style. Um, and there's a lot of kind of one-off projects that are still built to Siegel style, um, but of, often not by architects. And I guess that's, um, I think kind of bringing up some of the ideas that uh, Bo brought up about like where, where are the kind of Walter Siegels of today? Um, and I guess it's just that like, to be a kind of true kind of Walter Siegel, um, it's this idea that you don't need an architect to, to kind of build these houses. So actually we don't know that they exist because they're just being done without it. I would disagree with that. Um, um, I don't think that Walter Siegel ever said that, that, th that you don't need an architect. He was very much an architect and he, um, I mean, you couldn't, you, you, he, um, I think he was very interested in that as, as who had um, quoted him, that the ingenuity that the self-builders gave to the project was something that really delighted him and that and he could never have imagined. Um, and that was wonderful at the, at the end of his career that he saw that. But um, it was a whole lifetimes of, 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 uh, as a, of, of design and architecture that led to that moment. Yeah, and um, so there's, the sophistication of that of that that of the architecture of Lewisham um, self-build projects is something that a builder cannot achieve, uh, or a, an engineer can't even. Yeah, um, it's pure architecture as far as I'm concerned. So I, I think the architect's role is is not um, kind of um, doesn't disappear with um, some, um, the example of Walter Siegel. I think it's if, if anything, it shows us. Um, what the potential is for architecture. And I, I think that's what Hugh's talk was about. Uh, just to add to that, I think, Laura, um, your comment brings up two issues. One, as uh, Chris, um, as Philip has just um, touched on about the role of the architect and what that means today, if we're really looking at, uh, you know, change, shifting values. Um, do architects need to be, you know, polymaths? Are we sort of no longer just the designer in, in the scheme of things? 
Um, but also the issue which ties in with Athlete's talk about representation and what is being published in um, magazines and architectural digests and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, these are journals that the next generation of architects are looking at. And if, you know, all it's all they're showing a glossy architecture, then, you know, perhaps the people um, publishing the the um, work need to need to rethink the types of architecture that they are presenting um, in those journals. Couldn't agree more that it, it's it is tied into kind of the, the conversation about our economy and the market economy and these sorts of things because architectural imagery is has been somehow about selling. And I wonder whether we've lost it. It's art as kind of being communicate communicative and really about empowering people rather than selling to them. Um, and so much of the stuff that I look at is about selling and I, I'm not actually interested in it anymore. <laughs> I just want to know about the fundamentals, the ideas underpinning the work behind it. Um, and I think that that's how communication also, also with residents can whisk, is at danger of, of kind of going towards. It's like, here's a finished nice image of something as opposed to that struggle of working with them and drawing with them and, um, and so on. And I think the other other um, thing that the architect has always been able to um, to um, engage with and provide is a sense of um, working at all different scales, um, right up to the regional scale or you know down to the door handle. At, um, and um, and so, for example, what um, Lucy was talking about um, the economy of managing the land and the, the town and the house, um, all, the, all those scales together as one um, system. That, that's what the um, Bastide was, uh, example of the Bastide what did so beautifully. Yeah, that's the, the economy of, the, of the, land, the landscape and the city and the dwelling you know, um, together. That, that I think that's what I think that's what we can provide, and um, um, I've always thought that the the other professions don't have that sense. Like the engineers can't think at those different scales, or um, you know, we somehow have this. Um, and we're also thinking in cultural terms, um, and we can we can speak about things like beauty, and not only um, utility. That's another dimension that we have that. Um, um, I don't think that, um, I don't know, I don't, I think that if somebody just goes ahead and try, tries to build Walter Siegel houses today, first of all, they, the technology is not up to standards anymore, so they have to completely change it, re rethink it, but also they, they're, they're, the architecture is not going to be um, as sophisticated if they, if, they, if they don't have the, um, uh, if they're not architects, yeah, I, I think, and um, because the, the, our, um, our role is uh, crucial, I think, in, in society at, at many scales. This, uh, this discussion reminds me of, uh, of uh, a conversation I heard very long ago at uh, the university where I was then in Leuven with uh, not Siegel, but John Turner, who I just uh, learned from you was a, a friend of uh, Siegel. And he, of course, was, was the advocate of uh, architecture without architects. Um, well, I, <laughs> I think the debate we then had uh, with Turner was exactly on the terms that uh, Phil just, uh, just sketched. So, well. I mean, many of the examples in Rudolfsky's book, Architecture Without Architects, are architect designed um, in the ancient times, you know. Yes, of course. Um, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, if I could just, add a tiny thing to that not that i'm trying to say that both um phil and laura are right but uh my um certainly through my research my thinking about um siegel's idea of that was that <clears throat> to some extent there's some truth in what laura's saying and that i think in terms of the uh, uh design authorship of the individual houses uh Siegel was keen to relinquish some of that, uh, well, a large amount of that design authorship towards the um, um, yeah. towards the builders. 
Um, however, that's distinct from giving up design per se. And so in terms of the individual houses, he, he, he gave up a certain extent of design authorship and adopted in place a sense of um, uh, assistance, support, um, facilitation, a different role there. But that's not to uh, negate his broader idea of design authorship of the method, um, which he was um, acutely uh, designing and without which the designs of the individual buildings was not possible. And, the, and as you said, the aiding of these people in the process. Yeah. The, the kind of advising of them as you would any, in, on any architectural project. Of course, the client has a lot of um, part to play in the design. And as you point out, because the technical, um, uh, technical, environmental, ecological um, factors develop and evolve, actually the authorship of the um, method isn't proved not to be something that he did and then it goes off and carries on. It's something that needs uh, care, nurturing, uh, re reworking through. We need to start um, wrapping up now, but I'm wondering if there's any final questions from, or comments from the speakers or any final uh, questions from the audience. Now's your moment to say something. Um, Richard, if, if I can, I would, I would like, I would like to um, tie in with something that uh, uh, Hick just said about um, communicating and selling and uh, using architectural communication for commercial purposes, because that, that is something that connects uh, this conversation to what uh, Asli brought. A few things have been uh, said as the comments on, on, on her speech, but well, what, what was, what was uh, uh, well, nice about it and made it fit into this uh, into this course is that she showed us uh, uh, various ways in which uh, communication by architects uh, would would be not uniquely used for 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 commercial purposes where where she showed that actually the drawing uh, can use uh, many sorts of uh, registers of language so that they can be used for communication in various circles to various audiences within the studio maybe for publication within a catalog for commercial users of course as well but also you you could develop this any further conversation with yourself as a designer also conversations with uh, with clients just to to develop to develop uh, thoughts and then then I thought what was nice to her was that that this would change what you then really communicate because you are maybe not uh, not just uh, confined to um, to communicating certainties but also doubts and also things that are still open that you cannot just show because they are out of uh, uh, out of your um, reach as a designer. So well, that was just um, well, just a thought that came up with the course of the conversation. Yes, I enjoyed that very much. That when I mean, Ashley was talking about those sketches that were never meant to be uh, expected to be published or something, that they were, you know, working drawings that um, in a sketchbook or something um, um, that the architect is the thoughts of their own or maybe with their colleagues or with their client, but not, it's not something that as a presentation to have the, um, in a wider realm. Um, and yet they speak very clearly about um, the, you know, it's, um, not, not when we see them in the archive, that was, that was quite, um, I, I found that very interesting that, when you were talking about those ones, Ashley. 
Well, if I can just give a little remark on what you've been saying, um, Paul and Philip, why I came from that corner to the to the talk to today was um, actually also because of the means we have to communicate, which is much more available for at least in the society we live in, let's say European Western society, um, that causes a freedom and a kind of joyful like self-representation possible even when you're driving and when you're going in the subway or so. But at the same time, it causes this, this overdose, overpresence, which I see kind of a very uneconomical way of dealing with what you communicate to the world. And that is, I think there is also a certain responsibility also within our, our professional um, surrounding and which I see a lot, of course, with students, what you actually give and how much content is communicated. Although you go, it's a bit like even with COVID, you know, you go, you, you see every day, you hear information unfiltered, uncensored. There's a lot of content in it perhaps, but it's impossible to have any idea about it because it's just too much. And I, I just was wondering when Richard and I talked about today, um, uh, two months ago almost, like, okay, is this also not a sort of waste? And it's very immaterial. It's not about, it's not about the building materiality. It's not about the financial issues, not directly. But there is also waste which can happen mentally. It's kind of the kind of overloading of um, imagery, which maybe is a bit shallow when you watch it second time. And that was also why I was thinking like the communication indeed on very different audiences and very different levels. So it's not about the representation itself, but, and of course this ends up in journals. That was why Oasis uh, 105 issue practices of drawing deliberately left out almost any drawing you would see today circulating. It was a kind of choice. It was because it's not about actuality, it's about the role of drawing and you almost have to step back and shield yourself from all that um, circulation around. So there was where there was a kind of tiny uh, connection to the economy in the sense of waste. You mean a waste as in like overdose or? Yes, through the overdose also waste, waste yeah. of production, waste, waste product, production of uh, imagery which does not serve a content yeah. or does not directly communicate the content. So I asked myself, what do we serve then? Well, why is it produced at all? And that is in some way a kind of mental waste, I would say. So. Yeah, a good point. And I think generally a, a kind of recurring theme in particularly the last maybe 20 minutes of discussion is the relationship of architecture to consumption generally, um, which I think is worth us all reflecting on more. Um, but not now, because we have to wrap up. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank everybody very, very much um, all of our speakers and our panel. And um, I would like, if we can, to unmute everybody so that we can have a round of applause again, please. Let's see, can you all unmute? Um.